Dames en heren, dames en heren, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome in the Kai Theater. Uh, ik zou willen vragen van de, aan de mensen die nog achteraan zitten, er zijn hier nog plaatsen. Uh, de, we hebben speciaal stoelen gezet, zodat u diep in de ogen van onze sprekers kunt kijken. Uh, so welcome uh, to this uh, book lounge. I'm going to talk in English because the guests are also going to speak in English. This is part of the Burning Eyes Festival, our festival, the Kai Theater Festival, in which we reflect on socio-ecological issues. And um, we not only do that this through debates and book lounges and lectures, but also and maybe foremost with performances because we are, after all, an arts institution. But tonight um, we're going to present the Dutch translation from a book that was published in 2014 for in English called Degrowth. One of the uh, editors, Federico de Maria, is with us tonight. He made this with two more people. The book uh, has been translated into Dutch and is published by Uitgeverij van Arkel. You can buy the book, some of you did already, when you uh, leave. The um, book is translated in four languages already. This, Federico told me there's five more to come. Some of you uh, read, prefer to read Korean. You have to wait just a little while and then it will be published in Korean also. But today we, uh, of course, celebrate the Dutch version, Ontgroei. And we invited, besides Federico de Maria, uh, Paul de Grauwe, uh, whom I think everybody in the, uh, in the theater tonight know very well. Um, and mod it will be moderated by Dirk Holemans. The event is uh, hosted and organized by Oikos. So we welcome Oikos, not for the first time in Kai Theater, uh, for an event like this. Uh, so they will uh, talk you through some of the uh, subjects that are in the book, but of course this night will be not long enough uh, to cover the whole content of the book and therefore we have it there for you to buy and to read afterwards. But now I give the microphones and the word to our three guests and I hope you enjoy the evening. Thank you. Okay. Many thanks, uh, he, so I'm Dirk Holmans, I'm coordinator of Oikos, a think tank for social ecological change. And uh, he already mentioned our guests, but I want to introduce them more fully. So Paul de Grauwe is economist and chair in European political economy at the London School of Economics. And before he was professor of international economics at the University of Leuven, and also was member of the Belgian parliament for the Liberal Party between 1991 and 2003. Federico de Maria is a researcher at the Autonomous University of Barcelona, working on ecological economics and political ecology. He is since 2006 part of the degrowth movement and co-founder of the research network Research and Degrowth. And so I'm very pleased that he took the time to come over from Barcelona to talk about this Dutch uh, translation of the book Degrowth. And we are very happy with Oikos to have this publication because we have a tradition of translating inspiring books on uh, economy. So for instance, we also translated Prosperity Without Growth of Tim Jackson. I also want to thank two people who really, as a volunteer, took the effort uh, to translate the book. And the main translator is here, uh, Jan Mathieu. So I really want to thank him, uh, I would say, as he did this thing as a volunteer. Give him a warm applause. <laughs> so, I would say, uh, and of course, uh, Federico will explain it much more, but the question the book asks is whether our economic system, capitalism, is compatible with ecological limits posed by our finite planet and can realize a fair society. And of course, the answer of this book is, is clearly uh, a no. Uh, therefore, the authors argue that we need another economic system. And degrowth uh, is kind of a symbol for this other system. And as they write themselves, it's a project advocating the democratically led shrinking of production and consumption 
with the aim of achieving social justice and ecological sustainability. Of course, I won't go further into it, and that's for Federico. And um, I don't have to tell you a secret that most uh, professors in neoclassical economics don't really associate themselves with degrowth, eh? to say the least. I think Federico has a lot of experience. And uh, they rather talk, uh, they of course, I think now most economics, they admit that our economic system ha does harm to uh, the environment, but most of the time they talk about uh, external effects, e externalities. So for instance, when I drove this afternoon from Ghent to Brussels with my car, I couldn't take the train because I took loads of, book, bo loads of books with me, which of course you all are going to buy. Thank you for that. So I produce more air pollution, you could say, than I pay for. So then the solution could be that producers and consumers pay enough for these external externalities, and then the, mar the market will work better and the economy will become cleaner and greener. And so uh, whether this is a sufficient way in the light of our ecological challenges is of course part of the societal debate, but also the debate of this evening. And before we go into changing the system, I think it's good to start with uh, part of the analysis. Eh? What's the current impact of our economic system on Earth? Eh? Scientists nowadays, they talk about the Anthropocene. We are heading into a new time, a new era, indicating that now man-made impact is changing the basic characteristics of the Earth and its ecosystems. Eh? They talk about ecological boundaries that we are crossing that we are undermining the basic conditions for a good life for all. I put it bluntly, an ecological catastrophe could destroy capitalism. And so I think this is a good starting point to ask both speakers if we s make an analysis of the current state of the impact of the economy on our society, on uh, planet Earth. Yeah, let's start optimistic. How bad is it? <laughs> Well, I, I would say it's pretty bad, but we can do something about it. And, and that's why we, we are here, and that's why also we, we edited this book. The idea of the, the Anthropocene, to start from there, it was popularized by Paul Crutzen. It was not him who invented the word. But it gives this idea that we have entered into a new geological epoch, and that this started more or less in the 18th century with the invention of the steam machine, of course, in the UK. And then since there, we have seen an increasing uh, human impact upon the environment. And this is establishing a new uh, geological epoch. So this is the idea of the Anthropocene. And then now, of course, we are crossing some of what is being called by Stefan et al, the ecological boundaries, the planetary boundaries. So what is the problem there? Well, one idea is that, and the critique we make of uh, mainstream economics is that it has never recognized the fact that the economy is an open system. It is not a closed system. For the economists, they tend to describe it as a circular uh, exchange between producers and consumers, but with no relation with the environment. So at least since the 70s or the, the 60s and the 70s, people like Nicolas Georges Kuregen, Herman Deli, Kenneth Balding, and so on, they were saying, no, the economy is an open system. Open to what? Open to the environment. In fact, the economy is a subsystem of the environment, and it exchanges with the environment materials and energy. So what has happened in the, this geological epoch of the Anthropocene is that the economy is growing and that this growth is not only monetary, but it is also material. So we, requi we require more and more materials and energy. So what, what is the problem there with this process? <clears throat> in ecological economics, in the disciplines in which I'm in, we try to describe the society and its metabolism. So metabolism is the concept used by biologists to talk about the organism. And what the metabolism is, is the fact that I've just had dinner, I hope you also had, that we intake some inputs and that's necessary to keep, uh, to fulfill our function, uh, to remain alive. And this, what I intake, water and food, gets processed into my body and then it has to come out. So what we say is that the economy and the societies are doing something very similar. So on one hand, you have inputs, which are the inputs. It is the materials, the minerals, the metals, and so on, and the energy, the oil, 
the coal, the gas, and so on. This gets into the economy, it gets processed, and then it comes out because of thermodynamics, of course. So wh which are the limits there? We have two types of limits. One is on the input side, so we have a limited amount of resources, so this creates problem when we want to have an infinite economic growth because the growth is material. And then we have a problem, and you know with the limits to natural resources, I think we are all familiar with it, peak oil and so on. On the output side, what is the problem? The problem is what is called the assimilative capacity of the ecosystems. So what happens is that you have waste coming out, you have CO2 emission and so on, and that they are coming out in such a big amount that the ecosystem cannot process them without changing their states. So what Stefan et al. is saying when we are crossing the planetary boundaries, for instance, loss of biodiversity, climate change, uh, land change, and so on, what is happening is that we are disturbing the functioning of the ecosystems. We shall understand that the, the ecosystems are not in equilibrium, it's a dynamic equilibrium, but of course with climate change we are seeing that it is being highly disturbed and, it, and this becomes problematic not for nature itself, but for the humankind. So for instance, if we to look at the data also, if you plot, uh, plot on a graph CO2 emissions and GDP, then you see that the correlation is very, very strong. So what we do from ecological economics is to develop indicators, material, environmental indicators, to measure these things and then see, can we de dematerialize the economy or not? We think we cannot dematerialize it. And that's why we are questioning economic growth from an environmental point of view. This is not, and I will finish with this, this is not the only question we do to, to GDP, for instance, which has been questioned also by the feminist economists, for instance, in the 70s for not taking into account care and reproductive work and so on. But we are questioning GDP also because its relation with well-being is not so well established. The idea that the more we get richer and the happier we are is not that clear. For instance, Kahneman, which I know is somebody that Paul de Grove respects, uh, has put into question that and many other people in the field that is called happiness and economics. This has to do with the physical part of it. I want to make a short point on the political part of it, and here is where the political ecology comes in, is that we should be careful when we say that the ecological crisis will somehow destroy capitalism. I'm here and we wrote this book to say that we should change the system because we want to change it, because we want to improve our lives, mm -hmm. and we shall not expect a catastrophe that we, will know, we don't know whether it will ever come or not. The problem, what I'm trying to say, is that catastrophes is trying to depoliticize also the debate. Because if we say that we shall just wait for the catastrophe for things to change, then we can sit back, have a nice Belgian beer, which I love, and relax. But that's, that's not the issue. So the political question is who are the winners and who are the losers in this process? And for instance, I find that documentaries such as the one by Al Gore, The Uncomfortable Truth on Climate Change and so on, is arguing that we are all on the same boat and we should fight against climate change. I think he's mistaken, because we are not all on the same boat. There are differentiated responsibilities. There are people who are more responsible in countries for the CO2 emission and for climate change, and there are another group of people which is bearing the cost of it. So we should differentiate it, and for instance, one of the things of the Paris uh, summit and the agreement that was reached, it was very clear by the US ambassador Stern that the US would recognize the differentiated responsibility oh but that they would never accept the liabilities. They would never accept to pay back for the cost of the pollution that they made. So in the economist term, they would never accept to pay for the externalities. So I would leave it there now and then we can develop. Okay, <coughs> Paul de Graal. Grella, you have, uh, in a few interviews, have s you have been quite outspoken and said, uh, climate change could destroy capitalism. And so I think in the let's say, uh, the field of uh, neoclassical economy, it's, it's quite, uh, quite outspoken. So uh, how did you come to this uh, conclusion? Well, um, my analysis is very much uh, similar um, to what uh, you are saying. Um, that is that um, the economic system today is hitting against uh, physical, biological boundaries and um, and that um, if we don't stop this, if we don't introduce mechanisms that will avoid uh, this, this collision, if you like, um, then indeed um, capitalism will not survive. Um, um, because capitalism um, 
does not work under <coughs> extreme catastrophic conditions, right? It's like, uh, if I may use a metaphor, um, if a ship is um, sinking, then you need a captain who is a dictator, right? And who will organize how um, the ship will be evacuated. And you cannot let um, the market system solve that problem, right? Uh, voluntary um, bargaining, um, who will <coughs> um, go out of the ship first, will just not work under extreme conditions. And then you need an authoritarian system that will do it for you. Um, and, and that, I think, is, is why uh, capitalism, as we know it today, cannot survive if it hits um, this, this ecological boundary and, and if that leads to uh, climatic catastrophe, right, which is certainly possible. I mean, um, we don't know for sure. There are so many uncertainties about this, but one scenario that is plausible is indeed that uh, warming up of, of the earth uh, at some point lead to such an acceleration of negative effects, a kind of trigger points that, that then lead to uh, an unraveling of, of the ecological system and giving us no time to adjust. In, in a way you can say today you have two types of people when they look at the future. You have the optimists who say, well, you have global warming, but that's a slow process and um, we will have the time to adjust. Huh? We, we build higher dikes, for example. We start moving to other places right? uh, in an orderly way because we will have time. Technology will also help you a little bit to, to do these things and, and in the end it will be fine. Right? So that's one scenario. There's another scenario of which you can say this has a, a kind of non-linearity. That is that you have global warming and then at some point <coughs> you hit um, uh, a trigger, a trigger point, and then things accelerate. And you don't have the time anymore to adjust in an orderly way, right? The dikes cannot be constructed fast enough, uh, so to say, and, and then uh, you get catastrophic events and, 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 and also wars because then people will fight and, and then the, the, the capitalism um, will, will just collapse. So we have to avoid this. We have to do things um, that will avoid these horror scenarios. I don't know which one will prevail. I, I like to be an optimist and say <laughs> the world is linear. We'll have the time to to move on and to adjust, uh, but I don't know. Um, and so therefore, um, we should follow a principle um, that says that, well, we should take into account the worst possible scenario, because that's bad enough if it happens. You mean the precautionary principle? That's right, yeah, that's what I have in mind. So, yeah, we should certainly follow a precautionary principle here too, uh, because we, we just cannot take the risk uh, not to do it. Okay, having said this, so I think everybody agrees it's urgent. We don't exactly know how much time we have, but it's quite urgent. Uh, if you look at this economic system, what are the, uh, is it a kind of uh, transformation we need, uh, or maybe a kind of greening, or is it, are we talking about a real transi transition to a new economic system? Um, yeah, I would like to, to understand what a new economic system is. I mean, I've gone through the book and maybe you can uh, say a little more about this, what, what the new economic system is. I, I only know uh, um, basically two systems that we have experimented with. One is uh, a central planning regime that has been catastrophic for countries that mm -hmm. used it. And then the market system in many different forms. There is no pure market system, but mm -hmm. the basics are there. A system where people um, can take initiatives and start producing things and sell it in a market and find consumers and a mm -hmm. price will then emerged that uh, how, central, how central in this system is growth? 
Well, growth, of course, uh, originally has been quite important. Um, growth has been the dynamics uh, to, to find entrepreneurs and capitalists uh, to, to take initiatives and, and, and start with new projects because they want to get rich, right? Uh, but growth can take many forms. You do, I, I guess you are talking about material growth, but growth can also be immaterial. And in fact, increasingly growth today uh, is becoming immaterial, right? Uh, the, and the material component of growth is declining everywhere. Just to give, <coughs> to give an, an example, you take uh, a, a laptop today, of course, there is, a, there is a physical component, but the most important component now is just software, that is uh, services, right? Uh, when you take the value of a, a laptop today, I guess um, the, the material component might be just uh, 10 or 20 percent, and 70 or 80 percent, uh, something like that, I, I'm not sure, but around uh, these proportions is just services, right? People thinking and developing programs and software, and, and these have been active and they are paid for it, and they are part of the growth process, but it's not material. So I guess the key will be also to to change the nature of, of growth, um, where we have a smaller material component and a larger immaterial service component. And then capitalism can survive with that. I mean, there is, um, the capitalism doesn't need um, material production per se. Um, capitalists want to make money, profit, right? And uh, whether you do it um, selling uh, this kind of stuff or ideas or software or services for the capitalist is all the same, right? Uh, he makes money or she makes money. I should do these days uh, when you write an article, especially in, in, in the US, uh, you don't say he anymore, you always say she. So, but I'm still struggling a little bit with this. Uh, um, anyway, uh, so, <laughs> Nothing in capitalism, in my view, um, says that it, it, is it is somehow predicated on material growth. We can certainly move towards more immaterial growth, which, is, which will, of course, lessen the uh, pressure we exert on, on the environment if we can manage that and maybe accelerate that. But the key will also be, but maybe we are already in, in maybe I, I, yeah, first I think we have now an interesting point of yeah. debate. Yeah. So if I understand you well, if we dematerialize our capitalistic system and we produce more services, we can keep on growing between, within the limits of our planet. So of course the, the starting point of, of the debate in the growth uh, starts if you accept the repetition, from a different assumption. So the idea would be that uh, capitalism depends upon growth, on economic growth, and economic growth is inherently material. So we cannot have immaterial growth. That would be the main point. So to give the general picture, we could simplify. And we could say, following Frederick Soddy, who is a Nobel Prize for Chemistry in the 20s, but who wrote also about the economy, he would say that there are three levels of the economy. There is the financial level, there is the real economy and there is the real, real economy. So in the financial level, we could create the debt, then we need to pay back this debt, and we need the real e economy to move. Real, I mean manufacturing, for instance, no? to pay back those debt. But the real economy always depends upon the real, real or the ecological economy, which is it needs material in order to produce something in order to pay back the debt. If we take the example of the laptop, I mean, I'm used to this argument that we can move to a service economy, that's the dream of the European Commission. I think that's not possible. For instance, if you take a laptop, it has required moving tons of materials. <coughs> because for instance, in a laptop or in a cell phone, you have coltan and you have a lot of precious metals, which requires mining, which are non-renewable, which do not get recycled, and therefore every time you need to move a lot of materials. So when we look into trade, we talk about what is called the hidden flows. The hidden flows means that if you weigh the computer, it just weighs, I don't know, one or two kgs. But it has an e what we call an ecological rucksack in terms of water, in terms of material, and so on. 
The same for San Valentine, which was recently, we might give a rose, which comes from Ecuador, but that rose required maybe 500 liters of water in order to grow it. And it's water that we are taking away from other activities, such as subsistence agriculture and so on. So the question, central question here in the debate, uh, even in academia, is can we dematerialize the economy or not? So in order to answer to this question, this is why we are developing environmental indicators, such as material flow analysis, energetics, or what is called the AMP, the Human Appropriation of Net Primary Productivity. So what we are looking is, we are looking at, at the metabolism of a society and we are accounting for it. So we are trying to do empirical work to see whether the dematerialization is happening or not. So what is it that we found? If we look at the past, we saw that there was no dematerialization. We should also distinguish, and here it gets slightly technical, but not too much. There are two types of dematerialization. One is relative dematerialization and one is absolute dematerialization. Relative is relative to the GDP. So yes, we have achieved relative dematerialization in the sense we can produce the same amount units of GDP with less energy and with less materials. I'm mainly talking about European countries now. But we have not achieved absolute dematerialization in the sense if we look at the total amount of energy and material that we use in the economy to fulfill the functions and so on, then we are using an increasing amount of material. So what matters in the end for climate change, for instance, it is the absolute quantity of CO2 emission that we put into the atmosphere. We cannot tell the climate, yeah, but you know, the relative uh, CO2 to GDP it has decreased, so why do you change, you know? So the question is then, to be also frank and open about it, is in the past it has not happened. Then the question is, can we make it happen in the future? Well, I think the burden of proof is upon those who argue in favor of dematerialization. I think it has not happened, and there are a number of reasons why we think it won't be possible that it happens. One of these is, if I'm taking too long, you tell me. One of the problems is efficiency, no? Because we could say, <coughs> well, we can improve the efficiency of, of the system. That's what the materialization is, efficiency in material terms. But the problem there is that there is a phenomenon which is called the rebound effect. So for instance, and it's called also the Jevons paradox, Jevons the economist, and he understood it with the steam machine, no? Because he was saying, well, the steam machine is more and more efficient, so the society should lose less and less coal. But the society was using more and more coal. And this is what's happening with cars, for instance. Cars are more and more efficient, but the total amount of petrol that we use keeps increasing. So that's the, the real problem. And the rebound even says that because you are saving, saving, for instance, energy, then you have some phase saving, and you can reinvest them if you are in a system that overall is growing. That's why we are saying that we should be in a system that degrow. Okay. Maybe it's time for a reaction. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I think Federico, Federico says uh, we can make our production more efficient, but the overall impact on absolute scale uh, is still growing, or at least is too big. Yes, of course. I'm, I'm not saying that uh, dematerialization alone will do the job, right? I mean, uh, um, there is still <coughs> material growth, and, 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 um, and but, uh, in particular in, in uh, the emerging economies, there are the material growth um, continues to be phenomenal. Um, so that, that is certainly a, a problem. So the, the issue then is um, double. Um, one, how can we make sure that growth becomes less intensive in the use of energy and, and less um, harmful for the environment um, than it is today? Um, and there you have a story of economists that will say, well, we have to at least try to make sure that <coughs> the prices we charge for energy, for um, the, the use of, uh, or the abuse of the environment um, is, is the right one, right? Uh, that is a key element. You referred earlier to uh, externalities. Uh, and the problem of externalities is that these external costs um, that we generate, that you generated coming here. I took the train, by the way. I just wanted to, <laughs> wanted to tell you. Uh, um, but also generates external costs, right? Although less than your car. Um, but how do, how do you make sure that the, the right price is charged to those who use 
um, these um, inputs uh, who, who produce and thereby generate external costs. So that's, that's a key problem. And up to now, we have not managed to do that well. Right? So we, we do it in certain areas, <coughs> but clearly insufficiently. So the minimum that we should do is to make sure that um, we charge the right prices, but the market itself will not do it. The market on its own will not be there to um, internalize this external cost, that is, um, make sure that it is um, embodied in the price of the goods and the services that are uh, produced. And there you need an external um, authority, the government, who imposes taxation and sometimes other instruments to, to make sure that these external costs are, are, are really taken care of. And I think that allows us to go quite some way in, in hopefully solving this, this, this problem. Whether that will be sufficient is another issue um, that I'm not sure of, uh, but I'm confident it can help us a lot. And then the, the second uh, problem that I uh, had in mind is how are we going to um, reduce growth, right? uh, material growth? Um, we have managed to do it in, in, in Europe. Right? We are now living in, in a zero growth society. Right? Not yet degrowth, but zero growth. In the last eight years, growth in um, the, this part of Europe has been zero on average. In some countries like Japan, it has been zero since 20, 25 years. So that's possible, right? Of course, <coughs> the problem will be what do we do with uh, um, Asian countries, uh, African countries who will not um, be uh, very enthusiastic about a prospect that uh, would have to reduce their material growth to zero or even negative. So that is another challenge, right? That, uh, I don't know how to solve. I mean, how can we tell them um, you should reduce your growth rates? And um, we, s we have managed to do so, <laughs> look at us, but that will not be convincing, right? Given that but, our uh, we didn't per capita income is, is uh, uh, five, six, sometimes 10 times higher than their per capita income, and they will just tell us that we are hypocrites. So Maybe, that's, uh, a, that's a real challenge. That's probably the, the most important challenge, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we can move towards a society of zero growth. Uh, it doesn't look to me to be that difficult. But if we do, we will not have solved the problem for the world, right? Because mm -hmm. the Chinese are not going to say, oh, let's do like the Europeans and have zero growth, right? Uh, um, yeah. and, and so here we are probably with the most important um, issue that I don't know how to solve, uh, so. Um, Maybe yeah. if I can ask, uh, it's very interesting that you say, so we are in a Europe in a zero growth economy and it doesn't really gives us uh, structural problems because if you look at the messages of, for instance, the European Commission, well, without growth, it seems uh, it's, it's hell on earth, you would say. So does this mean that we could have other economic policy goals for our economy here? Well, I think economists, uh, at least uh, I'm an economist and I, I'm not saying growth is, the, is an objective of, of um, policy making. Um, no, welfare of the people is an objective of policy making. And um, in certain countries, this may mean growth. Yeah? I mean, in India, to increase the welfare of the people, you will have to increase material welfare, right? It's as simple as that. Here, I don't think that's necessary. But even there, I mean, we have to be careful because we, we also live in a very unequal society. We are relatively well to do, right? It's easy for me to say I can live with zero growth, you know. I'm, I have my house. Uh, I feel fine. Uh, um, I have uh, almost everything I like. Uh, and, it, and so let's have zero growth. And, and people, um, the bottom scale of uh, income distribution may not follow me, right, uh, when, I, when I say that. So here we have a similar 
problem as the worldwide problem, but at a, at a micro level of Belgium. So it can be a problem of distribution and not only of growth. That's right, but if you we could redistribute, but the first effect of redistribution would be more growth, right? Because you will, suppose we take it away from the rich, like, and, and we give it to the poor, well, the first thing the poor will do is to maybe have a, a car and, and, and have all the material stuff that we have uh, or maybe in buy, abundance. Or maybe buy an energy efficient house instead of now paying a lot for heating in an old house is also possible. Yeah, that's also possible. But <laughs> <laughs> so, but I think we have some points of discussion. Uh, but so, no, th there are many points that we can comment. But okay, so there are different things we can agree upon. That I'm not against markets, so we can use incentives via the markets via the prices. The thing is that we cannot have ecologically correct prices. It is not in, uh, possible to include everything in the prices, but it can be one of the mechanisms, and on this agree. And we have to think what other mechanism we can use. And one of these mechanisms is, in, for instance, to establish environmental limits, what is called CAP. And I think maybe Paul would be in favor of CAP and trade. CAP means you set the limits. This is how the carbon markets are supposed to work, no? You establish this is the total amount of CO2 equivalent that one emitter, one polluter can emit. And then if it needs to emit more, then it will have to buy permits from others that are emitting less. No? This is how the carbon markets work, which for instance in Europe was a kind of a failure, the price collapsed, and it's not working very well. Why is it not working very well? Well, because it has a lot to do with power, for instance. So where do you set the cap? Because of course the corporation are very powerful and they want the cap to be very high. Think of the Volkswagen scandal. The Volkswagen, what is it? It's trying to put a limit on the, on the emissions, no? the toxic emission that, come, that is coming from the car. So we clearly have not only an economic problem, we have a political problem. And we'll have to see how to deal with that. This is a complicated issue. The second issue that I think is emerging is this idea of uh, redistribution and growth. Growth has been used very often as an argument not to redistribute. Because the idea was, if the economy grows, everybody will be richer, and via the trickle-down um, dynamic, then we, uh, we will solve poverty. This has not happened. Trickle-down theory has been questioned a lot. Uh, and so we have to see what we do. And if we, st if, we keep, if we stop growth, then we have to redistribute. And this, of course, is politically also um, very interesting what it would happen. But the question is also, so what happens with the developing countries and so on? Well, one issue is that it is not enough for Europe to keep at zero growth. This would be the idea of steady state, for instance, from the 70s, from Herman Deli, an ecological economist, who would say we can keep an economy at a steady state with a stable population, with a stable economy, and so on. And of course, from degrowth, we say, well, this might be an objective in the end, but it is not enough. It is not enough because our society are too richer, so we have to scale down, to scale down a, a bit. And also, what we are saying is the growth. The growth is not less of the same. For instance, we could say, growth is more of the same. A recession is less of the same. The growth wants to be something different. So it is not only about less, less consumption of energy and material and so on, but we have to change. We have to transform the system and the way in which we fulfill the functions which are important for our system. So in relation to the question reform of revolution, if you want to put it in all terms, is we need both, I think. We need to push this system in the direction that we want. So don't, don't push the economy to growth, but push it in order to fulfill ecological sustainability, equity, and the well-being of the people, which is what we really want. And then focus on the issue of the developing countries, if I can make a, a point on that. So I agree with Paul, who is saying, which, who are we to tell them what to do? Well, this is what has happened with development. Development is a concept uh, that comes from the Western world. It is a Western, Western uh, cultural construct which has been imposed upon this country, saying you will have to do the same uh, to follow the path that we, the industrialized country, have followed. And this has been questioned. There is a whole field of literature called post-development, which is questioning this. And there are different um, imaginaries of different ideas that are emerging around the world, which are similar to the growth, which can be alliances of the growth, and in fact are in the book, in the section of alliances, but which are different because, of course, what the society wants, what the 
uh, life worth living is depends upon the cultural historical um, context of a specific country or region. So for instance, in Latin America, they talk about buen vivir. It is even in the constitution now of Bolivia and Ecuador. So economic growth is not anymore the objective. Or in, uh, in South Africa, they talk about Ubuntu. Or in India, they talk about Ecos Barrage. I would question, and with this I close, not to take too much, but I would also question the idea that necessarily these countries need growth. In fact, I'm familiar with India, where I've done part of my research. And I know there is a very interesting journal called the Economic and Political Weekly. And one of the main debates there is that the growth in India should be inclusive and green. And what this means implicitly is that the growth in India is not being neither inclusive nor sustainable. So I think that we can think of uh, ways to solve poverty and the sustainability challenges without growth. And this, I think, is, the, is really the, the key of the, of the debate. Can I react to this? Because that's what I just don't understand. I mean, um, consumption of uh, Indian person is maybe 10% of our consumption level, right? Uh, I mean, <laughs> the, the Indians today want to increase their consumption, right? Um, material consumption, right? Um, how else you can do it than by having more material production in India, I don't see. I mean, um, and, and you can say, well, maybe they should slow down and, and what have you and enjoy life more, but um, they just want to increase their material consumption. They want a car, they want television, they want all these things. We, have, we don't impose that on them. I mean, the Chinese, um, if I get married to a Chinese, I go to China quite often. Um, they want this material consumption, right? And how you are going to avoid that uh, this leads to more growth in these countries and that you can eradicate um, poverty without material, the increase in material production in these countries, I just don't understand. I mean, inevitably, you will have to go through this process of, of more material production, which I recognize is a big, big problem. I'm <laughs> but that's what these countries with a few billion people want, right? Please. Uh, so, so one of the things one of the things I said is that we need to reduce the material lifestyles in Europe and in industrialized countries in order to make ecological space for other people. On this, I think we we agree. In fact, even in terms of CO2 emission, we could think, no? Because there are things that we have and cannot be generalized. For instance, it is not ecologically feasible that every person on the planet has a car. So then if this is not possible, we should question the fact that we own a car. I'm not saying that tomorrow we have to give up the car because our society are centered not only around economic growth, but also around cars. So we have to envision a transition. I'm not saying it's easy. But I'm saying if something cannot be generalized, then we have to question it. So our material lifestyle have to change and they have to change radically. Then the questions of economic growth in India, for instance, or in other countries. We have one of the questions we should ask is, who gets the benefits from economic growth, for instance? Because this makes the difference a lot. Is it the 1% or is it the 99%? In India, there are more or less 1 billion people, 1,000 million people. Around 300 million people are what we con would consider a middle class. They have a fridge and a washing machine. They live in a flat and maybe they have a car. And then there are 600 or 700 million people which don't. So are we thinking that these people should get to the same level of consumption as the middle class? Is this ecologically possible or not? And is the economic growth that India is having right now helping the people at the bottom, the people in the middle, or the people in the top? So what I'm saying, some people say, no, the issue is population, not for instance, a common uh, point in environmental debate. Well, it, it really depends. Are we talking, when we talk about Indians, are we talking about a subsistence farmer? Or are we talking about a banker in Mumbai, which is probably richer than I am? So I think we should differentiate a bit. I'm not saying it's easy. I understand we, some people will have to increase their material consumption. I'm fine with that. But if we want them to do that and still achieve an objective of ecological sustainability, then we have to accept that zero growth in Europe is not enough. 
and that we have to decrease it somehow. And then the real question, the challenging question is, not only how do we manage our economies without growth, which is challenging, and we can look at Japan, for instance, 20 years without growth and unemployment at 3.5%, but also looking at how can we change the system so that we leave more ecological space for other people to fulfill their basic necessities. And I think this is challenging. I don't have the answer, but this is what the book tries to debate. Yeah, but still, if you look at the numbers, I mean, even if in Europe we decide we will not have a car anymore, right? 500 million people, no cars anymore. Well, we have uh, 1.3 billion Chinese who all want a car and, and 1 billion Indians who also want a car. So we, even if we go to zero car uh, society, it will not solve the problem at least if, if they want the car. So, <laughs> I, I so is it a yeah, cultural or an economic problem? It's a, it's so we, we have just the fact there that their desire to move up materially is unstoppable. You tell me it's not realistic, and I agree with you. If, when you add it all up, this will lead to catastrophe. But you don't solve it by saying, oh, let us now um, all of us, the 500 million bike, for example, even if we do that... It would be very good for our quality of life, yeah, of yeah, course, sure, it would especially be in this I city. Would love it, I would love it, uh, but it would still not be enough mm -hmm. uh, to, to solve that problem, right? Uh, and, and, and so when you look at the whole picture, it, it doesn't make me cheerful after reading your book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Second chance to make him cheerful. <laughs> Excellent. So one thing is that, of course, I'm not saying that we just need to get rid of growth and that will be it, because that was a recession. We got rid of growth and it was a catastrophe. So that's why I'm saying we need to transform the system. But then the point is, that's the question we are asking. And I understand even the challenge that, in fact, that's the big challenge. If the growth is not global, then we have a problem. But at least we can start. Because one of the reasons why the Chinese want to have a car is because they're trying to emulate our lifestyle. It is because for decades we have imposed our model of Western development. So that's, and I'm familiar with that, that's what, in fact, when you go to India, for instance, there is a complex of inferiority because they want to be like you. They want to be like the white. So I'm saying we cannot solve the problem. I have not all the solution, but I'm saying we live in Europe. The growth is born as a concept in Europe and to Europe apply. So let's start here. And then we will see, that's what we have to negotiate. It's the same thing like the climate change. It's a global negotiation. It was not very successful in my opinion, but at least we are attempting. But I think that we should make our own work first and then we will see what the other people want to do or not. I am aware of that, but I don't think that's a reason uh, to say that we should not do anything. I think we should start worrying and, and researching also together. Um, how can we face the challenges we have in Europe? How can we make a society which is more sustainable, not dependent on growth, and drastically reduce its impact on, this, on the ecosystem, and which improves, takes out the people out of poverty, which exists also in Europe, and I'm coming from Spain, half of the people of my age are unemployed, and which reduces inequality. So let's start to do our homework here, and that's the real question, how do we do that? And then we will see what happens in other parts of the world also. We will have questions out of the audience later, but I noticed already you're eager to join the debate. So we heard that at least we need the right price set. Maybe we need caps. We need some uh, changing in systems like mobility. Um, so we need strong governments to impose all these things or are this how are we going to, let's say, this, do this first step we all agree on? Eh? Put the right prices on the market. We've seen with the bank crisis, uh, the market out of itself will not uh, do it. Mm -hmm. So which institution will put the right price on the externalities? Well, um, in, in principle, it's only um, an, an authority outside the market that can do it. My argument has been that the market does not do it by itself, right? It will not self-regulate <coughs> these things. So we need um, a body outside <coughs> the market that does it and imposes uh, in the form of taxes or caps or some combination 
so that people take better decisions because basically that part of the problem can be characterized by the fact that we all take wrong decisions all the time, right? Uh, in the example you gave earlier, you decided to come by car because you did not take into account the harm that you would produce by the very fact that you drive the car. And if somehow we could find a mechanism that will make you pay for the harm that you produced while you came here by car, you may not have taken the car. Um, so that, that's that, the principle, the theory, right, that we would like to apply. And you can only do it by some authority that will enforce this. But this being said, we, we come immediately to one of the key problems, that is that, yeah, that authority is part of society, right? And is influenced by people in society. Yeah? You referred to that, Federico, earlier. Uh, th these uh, companies that pollute, well, they just try to influence. And they do it in many, many different ways. And as a result, it's extremely difficult to apply it. And we see it today in the US where uh, some of these um, very rich people have been able not only to pay politicians so, as, so that they would deny even the existence of a problem, but they pay other people to create uh, uh, pseudoscience that, that will deny um, the, the, the problem of uh, global warming. And, and so they, they influence society in many different ways. That makes it extremely difficult to act, right? Uh, so how, how, how can you do it? You, of course, you could say, well, let, let me be the dictator, right? And, and I will do the right thing, right? And I will not be influenced by these uh, people. But well, how we, long? Should be aware, we should be aware of dictatorship, even of, of good dictators. So here we are in a system where we use democratic um, processes and that can be infiltrated by many people. And that's what we have to work with. So um, still, it's the only way to do it. I mean, by, uh, and in fact, people like you and, and you writing books about this are the ones who can be a countervailing power so that we can force society to move in that direction. But I'm not very optimistic. It will be very difficult to do so. But there is only one way. I don't, I, I think, now it's for you, Federico, to, to explain to us what you mean with another economic system, right? Uh, I, I know, as I told you, I know only two, right? Okay. Broad systems. But what is the other economic system that will do the job, right? And that's what I don't understand. How exactly are you people going to make decisions in your alternative world? Okay, that's a clear invitation. <laughs> well, <coughs> In fact, well, one of the issues is that the, uh, the obstacle to the transfer, to what I, I don't call it transition because transition sounds too smooth, so I prefer to call it socio-ecological transformation. I think the obstacle are not the citizens, so in that sense, I don't know how much of a cultural problem is, but the obstacle are those who benefit <laughs> from the actual system, which are the corporations, and which have a lot of influence upon the media and the state. That's what we really have to challenge, and that we can only challenge with more, with more democracy. And related to the systems, I mean, we don't have a blueprint. I don't have all the solutions, but we try to give some of the ideas. So the first thing would be that uh, in the two systems that uh, you mentioned is that uh, the two prevailing dynamics there is one on the one is the state and one is the market. And the third one, which has emerged very strongly, even in theory, it even got Nobel Prize with the Ostrom, is the idea of the commons, the idea that we can manage resources together um, with communities and it can, it can be potentially also sustainable and we don't need necessarily to put prices on something that they didn't have a price before, for instance, and that we do not also need a central authority which will govern everything. Uh, it is not in the Dutch edition, it is in the French edition, which has a few more entries. There is a reflection on the state. We often advocate the state, you also advocate the state. There are lots of problems with the state, and we want a more democratic state. And one of the ideas we link with Degrowth is that we want a more, we question, of course, representative democracy, and we want some kind of more direct democracy. Then, what the economic system would be? Well, it would be a mix of all these, I think. 
And I think we have to understand that I think the growth is very strong and let's meet also our limits and our challenges. I think we are strong on why not growth, what is the problematic with growth, and that would be the diagnosis, so what are, what are the social problems and who is responsible for it. And I think that what, what is the challenge now is to develop the, the prognosis, no? which means what, have to, what has to be done, how are we going to do it, who is going to do it, and for whom. So these are the four main questions that we have to develop. And in that sense, I think it will be a mix and a multiplicity of strategies and actors. I am in favor of what I can call oppositional activism, people in the climate justice, environmental justice movement, which are stopping polluting projects like the Ende Galende, which I think is not too far from here. So I think that's positive. I am in favor of people building grassroots alternatives from below. There are lots of communities doing a lot of things. But individual lifestyle change or community lifestyle change is not enough because we need systemic changes also. So we need more research. I'm in favor of what has been called ecological macroeconomics with people like Peter Victor or Tim Jackson looking at how could we manage an economy without growth. And I'm in favor also of a different policy maker. Um, of course, changing the political system is difficult, but I think that there are some hopes from the so-called new left in the South Europe, which I hope is going to be also a little bit green, but it's not so certain. And in order to answer, like, we tried to imagine last year we live in Spain, there were going to be elections, and we tried to enter into a debate with Podemos, no? And we tried to imagine, okay, out of our books, because many people say similar things, no? It's very interesting, but what would be the policy implication of it? So we tried to develop what we called some kind of a ten policy proposal. It is just an example, but we can mention them quickly and it, maybe it gives an idea towards where the system it could go. First, we would be in favor of, if I talk too much, then you stop me. <laughs> because it you tends to You came all the way from Spain, so please. <laughs> be careful, I am Italian originally, so by birth. <laughs> it's even worse. Anyway, we can go on with Now I know that. Uh. <laughs> First thing, we are in favor of restructuring the debt. One of the things is that when you restructure the debt or you redistribute is like what Paul says, the economy grows. So we need to establish an environmental limit. Then we will have a problem with unemployment, for instance. You are in favor of a reduction of the working week, maybe to 20 hours per week, and to work sharing. So if we share our work, maybe all of us can work. And we are in favor of a basic income and of an income ceiling, establishing a maximum income. We, can under, we could talk about what the ratio between the basic income and the maximum income could be. We are in favor of a green tax reform. We want to generate employment and we want to consume less natural resources. So let's move the taxation from labor to natural resources so that we can generate employment and reduce our impact on the environment. We are in favor of stopping subsidies to polluting industries such as the um, flights and so on, oil industry, etc. And we can move those subsidies to the energy transition that we need to do in Europe. And this could also be an option for the investment that Paul is calling no? in Europe. We could direct those investments done by the state towards the energy transition that we need to do. And then we should support these uh, practices that are coming from below, which is called the social economy or the solidarity economy, agroecology, and the whole bunch of activity which are coming from the communities themselves, the transition towns and so on, and see also institutionally and from uh, the point of view of the legislation, see how we can support them. And then of course we are in favor of abolishing GDP, not as an indicator, but as an indicator of welfare. And we should accept that the complexity of our society cannot be reduced to a single unit of measure. And then we have to accept the matrix, a multiplicity of indicators, which has to do with sustainability, with equity, with the well-being, and with the poverty, and then direct our public policies in those directions, putting the attention on those indicators, multiple indicators, and not only one. And then we can do a multi-criteria evaluation of what the situation is like. So this could be an some of the policies. But the idea, the important idea is that people alone can change things, we can change things, we can consume differently, that's important, but that's not enough. We can and we should do things at the community level, that's good, but that's not enough. We have to do things at the national levels, and then it will reach also the international level, of course. And we could mention Gramsci here, but the idea is that if we have a state who is going to change the policy, the people won't agree with it. So we have to see, look, what is going on in society? What are people doing? And we have to reinforce those dynamics. So 
once we made policies, we will have people who will support those policies. Is it a challenge? Of course it's a challenge. Like coming out of the Eurozone, which is your expertise and, and that's what you are talking all the time, I understand that's also a big challenge. And what I'm saying is, this is another challenge that we have to face and we have to face it together with multiple strategies and multiple actors. Is this a kind of perspective of a new system? Well, I'm not sure it's a, a new system. I mean, uh, all the, what I've heard is that uh, m most of the things I would agree with, uh, not all, but um, most of them, and and this is all embedded in a market system, right? You, you, you talked about redistribution. You said people who earn more than a certain amount, we will have a marginal tax rate of 100%. And eh? when you say cap, uh, you say, okay, at, at some point, uh, if you, whatever it is. Which, has, one which million, has existed. Which has existed in, in the US and in the UK, you had mar top marginal tax rates of uh, 91, 92%, which is close to your ideal, right? Uh, so it has already existed, um, and w one could certainly go back to that. Um, but that doesn't change the, the basic economic system, which is still a market system, right? You just redistribute. It uh, does affect the market system. I'm not saying it will not have influence on the market system, but it does not destroy a market system. It's still there. In fact, this, these marginal tax rates in the US and the UK existed until basically the 70s, and, and this was a market system. Capitalism in those days was flourishing, so it can flourish. Uh, so you can do many things there. So what, what I was still not, not seeing is that what is your claim when you say we want another economic system? I think you are just talking about the market system that you would correct by redistributing, by making sure that the right prices are charged for activities that create external costs, or you would also add some subsidies for activities that you deem to be worthwhile promoting so as to make sure that the environment would be safeguarded. So th th these things are all perfectly possible within the existing market mechanism. Um, and, and the market mechanism is, is also one that allows anything to come from the bottom up, right? I mean, nobody tells uh, anybody, uh, stop doing what you do. They, you can do it. Uh, so what, what, what is so new in your okay, new so economic system? I, That's what I don't see. When Maybe I it is something that I don't yeah. see. But so when I listen to Paul, there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is he agrees on a lot of things and he sees it doable in a market system. The bad news is it's not system change. <laughs> That's the, that's, I would say that's still the good news. You don't, <coughs> you don't you, in other words, you don't need a revolution. I mean, it's, uh, well, the history uh, of revolutions is uh, not something that, maybe, that yeah. um, gives us much pleasure, huh? No. Sorry, yeah. No, the question is, um, when we try to, to outline this, like, what could be like an example of a program, it was funny because we got attacked from the two sides. So there were people saying, oh, you're not radical enough, we have to go further and so on. And then there were other people who would say, oh, come on, this is unfeasible, it's too radical and so on. So when we proposed it, we were playing because we were accepting some of the policies that Podemos was already putting forward and we were trying to push uh, the line a little bit farther. So in our vision, it's if a government would implement something like the policies I mentioned before, I would be happy. And I think it will start changing the system in the direction we want. Of course, I could say, um, what is the problem with the market system? The market system supposes that we can uh, allocate no, resources via the prices. And I said before that I don't think that we can have correct prices. I don't think that the prices can always include everything. And we have a problem with what is called cost-benefit analysis. For instance, in the market, there are, we can be on the market, we are on the market, but the future generation are not on the market now. So how do we take into account their preferences, so to say in the economist term? The market is another problem, which is the poor people cannot pay for the thing. So if everything is value in prices, for instance, if we 
just increase the prices of oil, the effect we'll get is that the rich people can still keep on consuming and the poor people cannot. So that's what I'm saying. I'm not against the market themselves, but I think we have to challenge the idea that um, we want to live into a market society because I think that if we allocate only with the market, we will have problems. So of course, the policies I mentioned before are somehow reformist, if you want. I would be happy if we would implement them. I think it would be a good step forward. I want to go even farther because I think that things like the carbon markets, the idea of putting a price on something that was not on the market before, I think it's problematic. And it leads to a problem which is also discussed in the book, which is the idea of commodification. The idea that we put a price on everything and then we let the market work. I think that is problematic and it has a lot of limits. We have to challenge that. And I could even say I want to challenge wage labor. But of course I would be taken as someone who is not realistic. So I'm saying, okay, let's start to move towards the right direction. And then in the process we will see how radical we want to get. So I could go back to Karl Polanyi who says, for instance, that the idea that land, labor, and money is a fictitious commodity in the sense the fact that these three things I've just mentioned are a commodity, are something with the price and exchange in the market is, re is re ra ra relatively recent in the history of humankind. Of course, and in this sense, it can be challenged. But this is something that takes time. So we can have that debate but I want to be realistic also. So in the short term, I'm saying we can do a bunch of things and I'm happy that you say that what I said would be feasible and, and you don't have too many things against it, of course, to certain idea. And then we can see step by step. So, thank you. Maybe uh, I can introduce a middle way uh, the French philosopher André Gors introduced the concept of revolutionary reformism. A lot of change, small changes together that change the system in the end. But I'm interested, you said that a lot of proposals uh, he mentioned in his ten, 10 points, you agree, some not. Of course, I'm very curious which you agree and which not. <laughs> well, um, let me take two. Uh, one was the, the, the idea that we have to share work. It's a very popular idea, but um, it's, it's not something that will solve our unemployment problem. Um, um, le let, let me give the following um, example. Uh, today, in Belgium, unemployment is mostly of the unskilled type, people that have very few skills, right, are much more likely to be unemployed. People with high skills are much li less likely to be unemployed. So what does it mean work sharing uh, to solve the unemployment problem. Are we going to tell the engineers here, uh, um, you know, we forbid you to work um, that many hours, you have to reduce your working hours so that the unskilled workers can take your place. That doesn't seem to me the right approach. Um, if, if work was indeed homogeneous, right, uh, everybody does the same job, then it, it could be the right solution. Everybody reduces its, his number of hours and that makes place for the others and, and therefore everybody will have a job. But that's not the reality of, of the unemployment problem. The reality of unemployment problem is the extreme um, and, uh, inequality in terms of skills, right? So the skilled are mostly employed and the unskilled are large extent unemployed. And you will not solve that by work sharing formulas. In fact, if you do that, you, you may also um, destroy the capacity of, of countries to, to generate uh, new ideas. I mean, you, you tell the, the engineers and the high skilled workers stop working and, and, and yeah, they, they do productive things, huh? not only materially, but also in, in many other ways. So that doesn't seem to me to be the right solution, but I know it's a very popular idea in this country in the 1970s, we started with this, right? Uh, you had, the, 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 at that time, famous Palasti, an Hungarian economist uh, uh, at UCL who came up with, with such a plan, uh, redistribution of labor, and this had disastrous effects because it led to all kinds of, of schemes uh, forcing people to work less. It did not solve any unemployment problem, right? Uh, not at all. Um, I do believe that uh, a market system has 
great capacity to generate new jobs, right? Uh, and, and we have seen it. Uh, we have seen um, since the 1970s, the industrial jobs declined massively in this country, um, not only in this country, in Europe in general. Um, but I know the numbers um, by heart in this country. In 1970, 40% of the active population was in industry, was employed in industry. Um, since then, this has been halved, more than half. Now maybe it's like 18% of the active population um, is in the industry. Um, so massive losses of jobs there, but at the same time in the service uh, sector, there has been an even larger creation of, of jobs so that um, unemployment, in fact, has declined compared to the 1970s, um, and the active population has increased also significantly. So I'm, I, I don't think that's the right approach, this work sharing thing. Uh, I hope you drop it from your <laughs> 10 points. <laughs> then, then I'm skeptical about the, the other thing, which is the, the basic income, right? Uh, which, which, which is becoming popular, but has been popular also for decades. In fact, Milton Friedman of all guys was a proponent of this, right? You may think this is a leftist proposal, forget it, it's an extreme right proposal, um, but now has become associated with leftist policies. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm charmed by this. Ma many of these things are charming, um, but you know an economist is always boring because he <laughs> tries to compute what the implications are, right? Uh, and in particular, um, if, if it depends, of course, what your precise proposal is, how, how high will the basic income be, right? Uh, but in Finland now, there, there are proposals to go to 800 euro a month, basic income, unconditional, because that's the, the whole idea. Everybody gets it, huh? bankers, uh, the billionaires, uh, and the poor get 800 uh, euro a month. There is an attractive element to this, namely, um, it eliminates what is called the unemployment trap, right? The fact that unemployed people today, um, they get unemployment benefits. When they find a job, you take away the unemployment benefit. And quite often, this prevents them from finding something that is attractive enough, right? Uh, because the unemployment benefits is a way to, to survive, and quite often these are unskilled people, when they find something in the market, it's barely more um, than the unemployment and, um, benefit. And as a result, they are stuck there, right? And, and it's really a rational choice to decide for many of these people, why get a job? Um, financially, you don't gain much. And that does away. So the basic income tells the unemployed, you get 800, whether you find a job or not, you continue to get your 800. So that's fine, that's the attractive part of it. But the, the problem is that uh, there are 10% unemployed in this country, right? And 90% and uh, that, that have a job. So you are going to give massive amount of money to these 90%. And this will have to be come from somewhere, from taxation, right? So in other words, you are going to tax the people much more. I made some calculation. If you um, today, if you would give 800 euro a month to all adults, right, in this country, um, that would lead to a, approximately about 80 billion extra spending. Now, you could eliminate some of social security spending. For example, unemployment benefits, you can eliminate part of the pensions, not all, huh? You are not going to say to the pensioners, I have good news for you, basic income, 800 euro a month. The average pension in this country is 1,200. And some people need more. If you say the average, it means that quite a lot have more. So that will not uh, start well, right? Uh, so in other words, you will have to continue to pay pension and um, health insurance. So when, when you take all this into account, you come to the conclusion that you will have to increase taxation as a percent of GDP 10 percentage point today, taxation uh, amounts to about 50% of GDP. So you will have to increase taxation from 50% of GDP to 60% of GDP to pay out all these 800 
your checks each month and then take it back from 90% of the population. And w look what you do then. You, you give the signal to, to all these people. If you don't work, you get 800. But if you work, we'll tax you more now because that's the way we, we, we have to finance the 800 that you get unconditionally. So it doesn't look like a good idea to me. So it will be a strong debate in Switzerland. Really. Yeah, yeah, but I, I, I don't know why I don't just make the simple calculations. When you do the simple calculations, that's the conclusion you come to. But maybe you have other so more. So just for the information, in Switzerland, there will be a referendum in yeah. June. Uh, but it will not be un unconditional. And the thing is, they, they will start it. Maybe they start. I don't know whether they will start it. But suppose they start. They will click, quickly come to the conclusion, let's make it conditional. Let's not give it to everybody. Otherwise, it, you cannot pay it. And so you have to abandon the idea that it should be unconditional um, and, and go back to conditional payments. But that's what we have today. No, nothing revolutionary. Yeah. So the revolution is a bit smaller now? or <laughs> It is fine. There is always time for a revolution. But <coughs> there are people who have waited a long time. So, so on the issue of work sharing, I mean, all these policies, I mean, now we mention them, we can debate a bit, but of course there are uh, lots of different perspectives on this. For instance, how do you, do you reduce the working hour? Do you take a Friday off? Do you reduce two hours per day? I mean, there are different policies we can discuss the debate. But on the work sharing, I would say, well, first difference with Spain, which is the reality and I know, is that youth unemployment is 50% and the one of, uh, and the general unemployment is about 25%. So of course it's slightly different because it is so large that we have to think of something. And we have also another problem that in an economy that is not growing, but productivity, we can assume that keeps growing, then you have a problem. How do you create employment? So if you have other ideas to create employment, I'm open, I mean. But the problem is that we have to find a way to solve that issue with the productivity increase. So one possibility is to share the work. I think here is also important because we, when we often talk about work, we forget the work that is not paid in society, what is called by the feminists the unpaid work. So there, is, there are works from the 70s that look at what is called the reproductive work or the care work. What do I mean? I mean buying food, cleaning the house, cooking, going to school to get the children and so on. So who is doing this work? This is historically been fallen upon, especially on the women, maybe not so much anymore in the Northern society, although I still think it's so, but surely in the South Europe, which I know very well. So when I say work sharing, I mean also the sharing of this type of work, which is not paid. Of course, one could say we could pay this work. Well, we can discuss about that. I don't think that taking care of your uh, child can, you can be paid for or you, or you always want to pay somebody else to do it for you. So to the engineers, I would say, well, you can work five or ten year, uh, hours less per week and maybe you can spend a bit more time with your family. In fact, when we look to the literature on happiness and economics with people like Kahneman and so on, you look that the determinants of happiness after a certain income is not income, but it is the time you can spend with your family, the time you can spend with your friends, the time you spend on spirituality, physical activity, and so on. So I think it could even be rational, if we want to use that framework, that people spend more time on, on activities that determine their well-being and can increase their well-being, which is not necessarily work. Then, if I work at the university and I enjoy what I'm doing and I want to spend time on it, well, go ahead, you do it. But if I'm a miner or I'm a factory worker or I'm a cleaning lady or a cleaning guy, then maybe I want to reduce my, the, the time I work. Then we can debate. If we reduce the working time, would it be for the same wage or for a reduced wage? I would be in favor for the same wage. But of course, I mean, we can get into a lot of uh, technicalities which are there. But what I'm saying is that I think it is legitimate to discuss about this thing in society and openly, and then we can see what the technicalities we can do. On the, sorry, I, I talk too much, but on the, on the, I don't have the ability of summarizing too much, but on the basic income, I'd read uh, some of the things you had read, you have, uh, some of the things you just said, so I was 
I was aware of your position. It is true also that there are lots of debates and lots of different basic incomes that could be implemented. Uh, again, for Spain, I know the calculation done by people like Daniel Raventos and so on. Uh, what they are saying is that there are different ways we can finance uh, the basic income. One possibility, for instance, would be to decrease military expenditure, in which I would be very much in favor. So we can have a combination of this. But they take more or less what you said. So they look at uh, income tax, and then they see, if we just tax more the 20% richest of the society, then what kind of basic income could we give to the society as a whole? And then they make a proposal of a basic income between 400 and 600 euro per month. And they take a data series of the last 20 years, and they do the numbers, and it looks pretty feasible. And of course, then we could complement it with other things. This should not be on the only thing. The other thing would be to increase corporate tax. There is these things in Spain that there is tax evasion because you move away from your income declaration uh, as if it was uh, income of the corporate, of the corporation, and then the, the tax that you pay are lower. And the other thing is inheritance tax. The things I don't understand is that in Spain, the last government in the last decade or so, they have reduced the taxation of the richest people. And I think that people are just not realizing that for the majority of us, it's a bad news. So the idea is I'm saying, if we can tax the people that earn more than one million per year, I don't think there is anyone in the room earning one million. So I don't see any problem with that and saying we redistribute that to society. Yeah, but I'm, of course I'm also in favor of redistribution, but I don't see the point of, um, say, giving everybody 400 you or amount, this will not solve the poverty of, of, the, of the poor, right? Uh, the poverty question will still be there. And, and, and it's extremely expensive because there, there may be 10 or 20% poor people and you give to the 80 and 90% 400 euros. It seems to me that you can do it in a more clever way, right? Than, than giving this massive amount of redistributing this massive amount of money and only a fraction is going to the poor. That I think it's just a better idea to, to be focused on these things if you want to fight poverty, well, fight poverty, not by giving everybody 400 euros. I mean, that doesn't seem to me to be a sound approach. And, um, and if you want to tax the rich, let's do it. But that's independent of the, the 400, I mean, I'm in favor of, of increasing the progressivity of taxation for many reasons. One is that we need a, a fairer system. And then the issue is, what are you going to do with the money that you have obtained by taxation? Giving 400 euro to everybody in society? Then I say, no, that's probably not a good use of the, the higher taxes you impose on the rich. There are probably better way to use that money. Right? Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm looking at my watch because uh, Paul uh, has to take a train, and so he will. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> poor guy. <that> <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was very stupid of me of telling I came by car. I'm too honest. <laughs> I'm too honest. <laughs> but no, he, so he will leave here uh, at uh, 8:50, and so, so I think. Yes, yeah, but now I want to give people the uh, occasion to uh, ask questions. He will stay all night, so <laughs> we can. Many beers. <laughs> Keep the difficult questions for him then, right? <laughs> so, uh, yes, in the back, uh, please.
So your point is we, sh your point is we should get rid of GDP growth. Okay, so your point is Can you be concise please because Okay, so the question is clear. We need other indicators and Europe should uh, use other policy measures. Yeah, um, of course, if you divide zero by some positive number, it's still z zero. Huh? <laughs> so um, this will not change much. Um, as far as the deficit rules are concerned, right? Um, whether you have GDP or any other number, as long as it is positive, um, zero divided by a positive number is zero. But um, yeah, I, I think this doesn't seem to me to be a, a strikingly difficult problem. Um, I take your point, of course, that GDP is not a good measure, and that's most of what you have been saying, Federico. It's not a good measure of, of welfare, of society, right? It, 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 for example, I guess you have it in your book also, when, when we destroy forests, uh, that's a plus in GDP because uh, we add the wood um, that has been produced, and we forget that now <laughs> there is no wood there anymore. And, and so there's so been the destruction. The so there are many, the many the problems with GDP that mm -hmm. we have to solve and have been attempts to do that. Uh, the, um, the, the, the United Nations, the World Bank, uh, they are producing green GDP measures. And uh, I can see that one, one could use these uh, then to formulate um, the, the criteria in Europe, although I'm not very fond of these criteria, whether you divide it by green GDP or normal GDP, they look stupid to me. Um, so whatever you use as a, as a denominator. I mean, on agreeing with Paul, the problem is that uh, everybody knows that GDP is not a good measure of welfare, but we still keep using it. That's the contradiction. So. The point is when we will start to take concrete measure. So there was the FITUC commission in France, uh, OECD agrees, the European Commission agrees. Everybody agrees it's not a good measure, but we keep, we stick to it. So that's, that's a big challenge. But I want to react to the issue of, well, why don't you call it a different growth? So I'm, a, I'm aware of this argument that, oh, but you know, we want the, the growth of good things like education and health, and we want the degrowth of bad things like, I don't know, contamination and inequality. But what I'm trying to challenge here is that logic that growth is better. It is that logic that the more we have, the better we have. That's what I'm trying to challenge. So in this sense, I know that growth is associated with the positive connotation in our society. But what I'm trying to suggest is can we think differently? For instance, can we not talk of flourishing? For instance, with art, no? We are in a theater, so maybe we can uh, make a reference to art. We never say that art is growing. And nobody would say that uh, the painters of today are better of the painters of the 30s. Or nobody would say that a, a bigger paint, a painting is better than a smaller one. I mean, that growth logic is problematic. So that, that we have to challenge. And when I say degrowth, I do not mean it literally in the sense of I will struggle for the decrease of GDP. Because if I say it's a pointless or a problematic or an arbitrary indicator, 
I would be, I mean, full arguing for the decrease of GDP. What I'm saying is, in a world, in a society where everybody <coughs> seems to agree there is a fake consensus that we need GDP growth, that I'm saying degrowth as a provocation. And but what I'm, cal I'm calling, I'm calling for something different. So my objective, so is to say, to make a metaphor, I don't want to make an elephant leaner. I want to transform the elephant into a snail, into something different. Snail? Are you sure? <laughs> yes. No, I can justify it, but s s quickly. The, the I'm snail joking. Is, okay. No, that's okay. okay. Explain okay. the snail. <laughs> no, you, no, no. Just do it. No, it, i it is in the book, and uh, it has been often been used, not by me, but uh, by the degrowth movement as a, as a symbol. And the idea was proposed by Ivan Nilich, for those who, who know him, a writer from the 70s. And the idea is that the snail, you know, the, what's the name of the, the shell of the snail, it grows until a certain point where it stops. Why does it stop? Because if it keeps growing one more round, the, the, the shell will collapse and the snail will, will not be able to move and it will die. So it has this idea of limits within the system. So of something that, okay, can grow, but up to a certain uh, um, point of maturity, and then we flourish. That's why this name. <laughs> okay. a metaphor, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, in the back, please. I don't think it has much to do with money per se. I mean, um, it has everything to do with what we talked about earlier, the, the fact that the market system is not capable to um, give a price on a number of activities, um, like external costs, right? um, uh, discharge of CO2, uh, uh, and, and the market system, when you don't intervene, will not put a price on there. And of course, it, it is true that when you then add up everything that has been produced, and when you add it up, you express it in one unit of account, which is money, like euros or dollars, you miss something. That's not because of the money. It's not the money which is at fault, but um, it's the system that is not capable of um, internalizing these external costs of making sure that those who produce these external costs also pay the price for it. And so it's the market system that fails there. Well, um, of course, it, 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 the, the money is neutral there, right? It's, it's a unit of account. There's nothing wrong with having a unit of account. Um, but of course, if some of the accounting that you do misses important negative activities, then when you add it all up, you will not have the true picture, right? You still will need a unit of account. If you correct for all this, if you say at some point, okay, we are going to tax those who um, emit CO2, we will going to tax, which, which means giving a, a value, right? You, you, you force them to pay for this. Then it will be in your accounting system. And the unit of account that you use will just reveal that. But money as such is not to be blamed here, right? Uh, uh, money is just something, uh, a convention, uh, an, an accounting. Um, and and if, if we fail to account for a number of activities, it must lie deeper, right? And, and we have to intervene at another level. So it would certainly be wrong to decide that we, we shouldn't use money. I mean, what, what do you mean with another value? Another? The remimbi or something. That's fine. I mean, you can, you can use any.
How about what? Upstairs. Now you're talking about something very different, which has to do with the financial system, right? Uh, that's right. Yeah, but uh, but uh, let's okay. But let let's let's do the the, the analysis here, right? Uh, it, it's certainly true that um, the financial system and the banking system has a number of inherent problems, right? Uh, again, is dissociated with the unit of account. Whatever unit of account you use, you will have problems if you have financial system that are not regulated, uh, banking systems that are not regulated. So you will have to intervene there at a level of regulation of these financial activities. Um, and then you will still need a unit of account to, to add it all up. Um, so don't, don't uh, create false enemies, right? Uh, we have already enough enemies. Right? Okay, yes. Capitalism, anything is possible. <laughs> but look at look at DNB, right? That's something similar. I mean, you, you have capacities there, uh, apartments that are not used uh, efficiently, and and some guys uh, found out well we can get rich by organizing a market, and they organize the market that does exactly what you you are saying. Well, exactly, it's something similar, sharing an existing pool of apartments so that uh, um, you can do it cheaper and, and more choice and, and what have you. How, I'm, I'm all in favor of, of this, right? And, and in fact, the market does do that. I mean, if you let people free, they will try to do that if it makes sense to do it, right? Uh, um, so I'm, I'm certainly all in favor. I'm in favor of freedom. <laughs> okay, did it go? Well, if we want to put restriction in <coughs> upon market, it doesn't uh, mean we are against uh, freedom, no? We are against market yeah. freedom, maybe, but yeah. I mean... Freedom is always limited yeah. by the freedom of the other one. So, so one of the issues, because it's coming again and again, on, on the issue of, of price and, and value. So th the question is that there is something we should recognize, and it's incommensurability. Incommensurability means that the unit of measure cannot measure everything. So there are things on which we cannot put a value. So for instance, what is the price of climate change? Or what would be the price of a nuclear accident here in Belgium? I think you are debating this in these days, no? <laughs> Not the price of it, but the nuclear accident. So that's difficult. So what would be the price? Infinite? So then if the, infin if the price is infinite, what should we do? Then we shouldn't do it. What I'm saying is that we cannot regulate everything with the prices. Of course, we can try to correct them a little bit, but they will never be correct. And on the thing is that, on this issue of externalities, the problem I have with the concept of externality is that by saying externality is external to the market, it seems that oh, it's a little problem, it happens sometimes, but we can correct it by internalizing the externality. For instance, by saying, okay, what would be, sorry, what would be the price of the CO2 emission from your car tonight? <laughs> and, then, and then what price, <laughs> What price shall we put on it? I think we will never get to a conclusion of what would be the price of the emission from your car. It's a sophisticated issue that we will never uh, be able to solve. I think I know there are economists that think that it can be solved. I'm aware of this, the fictitious market and so on. But I think it's problematic. So the idea is let's accept this uh, incommensurability. And in fact, I think that in the system, in the market, we should not talk about externality. We should talk about cost shifting. Volkswagen is shifting the cost to society, future generation, and so on, of the toxic emission. And as um, Carl William Kapp, an ecological economist, said, capitalism is an economy of unpaid cost. And climate change is a cost-shifting success. 
a cost shifting success in the sense that industrialized countries have succeeded to contaminate with no liability. So they will, they, I don't know if they will pay back or not. And in fact, they cannot pay back because climate change doesn't have a price. But that's the trick there. That is not just a matter of increasing a little bit the price and everything will be fine. But I mean, this is a controversy we can have and then we yeah, can but go but on, on but and on. But you really say the same thing as I'm saying. You just use different words, right? I mean, uh, um, and of course, I agree with you that um, in many cases, it's very difficult to put a, a price on it. I fully agree with you. I mean, how can we, can, <laughs> how we can compute <laughs> the price, the cost that he has created by coming by car? <laughs> it can only be compensated by s selling all my books. That's the only answer. <laughs> So, the, so it's, it's impossible to do that. But I, I do think that there is a mechanism to, to do. We know the direction, right? Uh, so we know that he did wrong, so he should be punished. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But the thing is, uh, when, when you have this, what you call cost shifting, and what I call externalities, of course, we don't know exactly what these costs are, how high they are, what the exact price is. But we know the direction. And therefore, we can do in a kind of experimental way, we can say, okay, let's tax, for example, these activities, these CO2 emissions. And then we find out after a while it was not enough. The cost was, in fact, higher. So we have to raise it. Or maybe it's the other way around. We say, well, it was too high. So we, we have to, we know the direction in which we can go. We, we cannot compute the exact prices, there I fully agree with you, that's out of bound of what we can do. But, but surely we can go in the direction that um, then exposed will tell us, how oh, did we do enough, didn't we do enough, and then we can go on or stop doing things. I mean, that, that's the way we should go forward, I think. I mean, I, I don't want to, we can go on, but I mean, my point there would be that uh, we can look at other mechanisms and that putting a price sometimes creates a problem too. But I mean, that's a long debate we can have. Okay, I see. So I don't really want that you miss your train. No, so still have one, yeah, question. one question, yeah. last question. Maybe to Paul. Too. Yeah, one question. Uh, so then we keep it five minutes in. So, if Paul wants to react. Well, I mean, um, I, aren't you asking the same question that I formulated <laughs> in the beginning um, <laughs> as a criticism to Federico? How are we going to, to do that um, when in China there are more cars? Right? Uh, even if we reduce our car consumption, Globally, this will have very little effect on the total production of cars, given that the Chinese, um, uh, their level of consumption today, and uh, they want to catch up, are going to want to go into more car consumption. But you're saying, we're, you're saying that we are producing the cars for the Chinese market. I don't think that's well, correct. That's not, in fact, most of the cars now are produced in China itself. Huh? Quite a lot of Western companies, but, yeah, but it's produced. Market. Yeah. So we need the car, then we need to look after the car, because if we can't our lifestyle. Okay. Um, so I would ask. Uh, because, as I said, I don't want Paul to miss his train. So we leave this very smart question to Federico, and I would ask a very warm applause for uh, Paul de Grauwe. Thank you very much. But uh, as I said, 
he's not going away <laughs> for the moment. So, did you want to add something to this question? Yes, please. Okay. Okay, so for the people that didn't really uh, could hear it, there's a chapter in the book on Depans and it refers to cultural uh, habits, rituals, where people like in a potluck, what we could say, throw away a lot, a lot of value because, and they do it because it gives them status. So we don't need a Ferrari for our status, maybe we can give a lot of things away for our status. No, I, w I was thinking whether I could combine the two questions. I'm not sure I'm, I'm getting uh, your question correctly. Um, because th there is an old debate uh, among economists also. Is it a problem of consumption or is it a problem of production? Who is leading the system or not and so on? Depending if you are a Marxist or not a Marxist, if it is the system. Uh, um, I think it is both, in fact, because one of the things is that uh, there is a crisis of overproduction. Right now we are producing too much and people are not buying. So there is marketing and advertising in order to foster uh, new consumption. There are also techniques such as uh, program obsolescence, the fact that your iPhone will break down after two, year, two years so that you buy the five or the nine or whatever where we are now. And uh, so that's a tricky thing. But if you are asking me if we have to give up something of our material lifestyle, then I would say yes. To what point? I don't know. We can discuss it democratically. I'm no one to say how we should live. The feminists, I think, ask two questions which are key here. One is, what is a life that is worth living? And how are we going to sustain it? So when they say, for instance, how are we going to... So what would be a, a life that is worth living? Then we could ask, do we need a car for a good life or not? No, what type of material consumption do we need for a good life? And we can have a debate in society about that, which have, we have not often uh, had. And then the second question is, how are we going to sustain it? They're thinking in terms of care and their productive work, what I said before, who's going to uh, clean the dirt, no, and somehow. Uh, but I could also say as an environmentalist, how are we going to sustain those lifestyles from an ecological point of view? So these are open questions. In the books, I have not said it before, but the book is organized as a dictionary, and it takes 50 different concepts, which I think are key to this debate and which emerged tonight. Some, are technic some uh, have to do with the economy, but some others, like conviviality, autonomy, or care, do not have to do with the economy. And each different authors try to explain those concepts. So it's a little bit to clarify the debate. On the issue of the punks, it's the book tries to explain the debate on the growth, and then we, the editors, uh, Giacomo D'Alisa, Giorgos Kallis, and myself, try to um, say, explain in the epilogue what we make out of this vocabulary. But the idea is that we offer ideas and words because we think that to describe the new society we want, we need new words and new concepts. Some are in the book, some will come from you. And that we think that each of the reader can make out uh, whatever they want from the book by combining these different words. What we combine and what we put on the table is this idea of the punks. So you, you all speak French, so you understand what the punks means. It's like expenditure somehow in English. <laughs> and the question we try to put there, and it's even more radical of what we have been saying uh, tonight, is this idea. 
that the problem in society might not be scarcity, but it might be surplus. So the idea is that in our society there is the production of a surplus because, for instance, there is a lot, we work a lot and we are very productive, so we produce a lot. And then we have a surplus. What do we do with that surplus? What capitalism does, it reinvests that surplus in order to produce even more and to get even more money, and it's a cycle. So the hypothesis we are putting forward, and I know it's like it sounds strange, it is that one option to break that cycle it might be at some point to destroy part of that surplus so that it does not get reinvested and it step in it stops that growth logic and that growth dynamic. Then there are many things we should clarify. So what do I mean by the surplus? Do I mean that we have to burn all the oil or all the gas or coal we have on the planet so that we stop the accumulation process? I am aware of the environmental limits. So this debate is in reference to everything else that is in the book, in the fact that we have ecological limits and so on and so forth. But one hypothesis that comes from the work of anthropologists is that even in society which we could say live sustainable within the ecological limits, there was a surplus, for instance, we could say of labor. So people after fulfilling uh, their basic needs, they still had time. So what they would do? Well, some of the times they would do activities producing something and then they would collectively dis uh, destroy. What is the meaning of sale? Is it destroying for destroying? No. It is the idea of generating meaning. So in our lives we do not only need material things. We need also meaning. We need also sense of life, meaning of life. So why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? And so on. One idea is that instead of pushing as in this society where we have a for I have a Ferrari for myself, and a Ferrari is a positional good, which is another entry in the book, which distinguish and make me superior to you because I have the Ferrari. We are saying, why don't we think of dynamics in society and we can celebrate together, have a party, to make a simple example, in which we burn the time we have and the food we have cooked and spend maybe 10 hours. We can burn a Ferrari. Yeah. <laughs> That's also a good idea. The question would also be that if all of us had a Ferrari in our society, a Ferrari would not be a Ferrari. It would be a Fiat 500. <laughs> so, it's trying to question this. It's challenging. Okay, another chapter of the book you really have to read. I think we have time for one, maybe two last questions. Yes, please, and then. Okay, the future of the welfare system in a degrowth society. Okay, I don't have a full, a full answer on that because I have to tell you bad news. To my knowledge, it was only in 1991 that Herman Deli, a macroeconomist, asked for the first time the question, how could we manage an economy without growth and be it ecologically sustainable and still uh, somehow fulfill the welfare of the people and so on. So it is something relatively new in the research, and that's a problem because the economist has always focused of how do we relaunch growth. So the austerity we are living now, of course, it's it's not it's not what we mean, no. And the structural reform they are talking about is things like internal devaluation, which what they mean in fact is reducing the salaries of people and destroying the welfare state. And that in part is that is done in order to rec to regain the stability of the system and relaunch growth for some future. Uh, in which we will live happily. So the question is how do we keep a, and finance a welfare state in an economy that doesn't grow? In principle, it is totally feasible in the sense that we don't need an economy that grows at 3% every year in order to finance the welfare state. It can be stable. For instance, if an economy grows at 3% every year, then it means that more or less it doubles every 30 years. That, that idea of compound or geometric growth, it's completely crazy. So we are now working, I'm now myself also working on a project which is called Ecological Macroeconomics, and I mentioned before P. 
people like Tim Jackson and Peter Victor, and those are the people that are working on it. In principle, from what we see, it is feasible to finance it. Then, in my opinion, we can question also the welfare state and question the education system and question the health system. I think there are things that need to be changed there. I'm not happy as it is now, and I just don't think that we need more money. We need a different health system, we need a different education system. For instance, that education system does not only aim to create productive citizens, but it, it aims at, cre at creating emancipated and free citizens. But that's another question. But in the terms of money, I think, I think in principle we can do it. It is totally feasible. The challenges of ecological macroeconomics at, at the moment, as I know it, is that if you want to play with models and with empirical data uh, in order to see w how the situation, how the system works and what could happen in the future, which is tricky anyway, it is how you manage a model that models financial system on one side and the ecological system on the other side. How to merge those two is something that has not been done yet and that we should be looking at. Okay, please. something external you mean the government or and what yeah. do you mean by politics yeah, yeah. you mean parliamentary politics or you mean uh, government system which is outside of the economic system or the uh, economic system uh, you, you mean uh, you say you, we need a political system yeah. outside the economic system yeah. Yeah. Because so we need Mm -hmm. So actually you say we need democracy again. So you say we don't we should we stop we should stop discussing economy and we should start discussing politics. I think you're right. I think you're right and one of the th Degrowth basically does two things. So if we want to simplify, degrowth is the hypothesis that l we can live well with less. That's like the basic definition. But degrowth is two things, two main things. One is criticism and one is proposal. Criticism is the criticism of the hegemony of growth. This idea that we need growth in order to solve our problem in our society. But it is not only a criticism of growth, it is a criticism of what is called economism. The idea that we reduce everything in economic terms. So right now in Europe we just talk about the stability mechanism, the spread, uh, the interest rates and so on. So that's problematic. We, I agree with you, we have to talk politics, we have to talk philosophy, we have to talk about our dimension. Economies can be part of the process, but that should not be the central uh, of the idea. And so one thing is that Degrowth is trying to challenge this, and on the other end, is trying to propose something. I don't have a final solution, and I'm saying it has to come from the people. And democracies, democracies is one of the central pillars of degrowth. Paul Degrowth said it. You know, there is this funny thing between Degrowth, the surname, and Degrowth <laughs> from foreigners. You know, I didn't. So I know you would pronounce it different, Degrowth, and uh, but for me, it's very funny. Anyway, <laughs> the the point. Is the point is that you only say it now when he's gone. No, <laughs> I, I told it to him before, so I, I didn't want to be unfair. But 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 the thing is that democracy is a central pillar, and what I wanted to say is that Paul said it before. We could have a dictatorship. That's a possibility. We have an eco dictatorship, and they impose all the rule, and that's it. I mean, that's very dangerous. So that's why the group is always putting the emphasis on democracy, and it's a central thing. So I'm not saying also. Because one external thing could be the economy, but another external thing could be the environment. For instance, we have to do all this in order to save the environment. No, there is no such a thing as the environment. And I could even argue that there is not such a thing as the economy. The economy separated from the politics, from the society. All this is together. 
And if you are doing something, it is political. Political in the sense that it has to do with relations of power. Political that it has to do, we have to ask the question for whom. We have to ask the question who are the winners and who are the losers. These are the political questions. These are the philosophical questions that we have to ask and put on the table. Unfortunately, we are always pushed back to talk about economics. I'm, I was trained as an economist. I'm sorry. It is a little bit like, uh, like your car, so each of us has its weakness, no? But I agree with you. And, 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 and the book, I think, describes all this. The book has uh, almost 100 people have worked on this, so it is a collective project with people from five different continents, from different perspectives, but with a common horizon. That's the idea of the growth. We need a common horizon. It doesn't matter. We can use another slogan if you want. It is a slogan, but to this idea that we can unify from different perspectives the search for something different, a world that would be more equal, more fair, more sustainable, and centered around the well-being of the people. I think this is a perfect closing of this evening. And and I'm very sure that now you are so curious about these 50 entries in the book, these 50 keywords that will change your life. Give a warm applause for Federico de Maria. And now we're going to have a Belgian beer. Why not? <laughs> Even more than one. <laughs> Thanks.